Shalom, shalom. So here's another book review from out my library. I know this has been long overdue. The book under review will be The UCC Connection. So please follow along and enjoy. This article has really filled in the voids that kept me from fully understanding things. I have found it to be one of the best discussions on this subject of freedom and how our government has managed to take that freedom away from us, all the while giving lip service to the Constitution. The title of this article is The UCC Connection. The noteworthy author is Howard Freeman. It is dated September 22, 1991. The UCC Connection, How to Free Yourself from Legal Tyranny by Howard Freeman. This is a slightly condensed, casually paraphrased transcript of tapes of a seminar given by Howard Freeman in 1990. It was prepared to make available Mr. Freeman's knowledge and experience in his search for an accessible and understandable explanation of the confusing state of the government and the courts. It should be helpful to those who want to develop a deeper understanding of this information without having to listen to three or four hours of recorded material. The frustrations many Americans feel about our judicial system can be overwhelming and often frightening. And like most fear, it is based on the lack of understanding or knowledge. Those of us who have chosen a path out of bondage and into liberty are faced, eventually, with the seemingly tyrannical power of some governmental agency and the mystifying and awesome power of the courts. We have been taught that we must get a good lawyer, but that is becoming increasingly difficult, if not impossible. If we are defending ourselves from the government, we find that lawyers quickly take our money and then tell us as the ship is sinking. I can't help you with that. I am an officer of the court. Ultimately, the only way for us to ever have a snowball's chance is to understand the rules of the game and to come to an understanding of the true nature of the law. The lawyers have established and secured a virtual monopoly over this area of human knowledge by implying that the subject is just too difficult for the average person to understand and by creating a separate vocabulary out of English words or otherwise common usage. While it may at times seem hopelessly complicated, it is not that difficult to grasp. Are lawyers really as smart as they would have us believe? Besides, anyone who has been through a legal battle against the government with the aid of a lawyer has come to realize that lawyers know procedure, not law. Then answered one of the lawyers and said to him, Master, thus saying, Thou reproachest us also, and he said, Woe to you also, you lawyers, for ye lay men with burdens grievous to be borne, and you yourselves touch not the burdens with one of your fingers. Woe to you lawyers, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. You enter not in yourselves, and them that are entering in, you hinder. Open parenthesis. Christ teaches his disciples. Luke chapter 11, verses 45 through 52. Close parenthesis. Besides, anyone who has been through a legal battle against the government with the aid of a lawyer has come to realize that lawyers learn about procedure, not about law. Mr. Freeman admits that he is not a lawyer, and as such, he has a way of explaining law to us that puts it well within our reach. Consider also that the framers of the Constitution wrote in language simple enough that the people could understand, specifically so that it would not have to be interpreted. So again we find, as in many other areas of life, the buck stops here. It is we who must take the responsibility for finding and putting to good use the truth. It is we who must claim and defend our God-given rights and our freedoms from those who would take them from us. It is we who must protect ourselves, our families, and our prosperity from the inevitable intrusion into our lives by those who live parasitically off the labor, skill, and talents of others. To these ends, Mr. Freeman offers a simple, hopeful explanation of our plight and a peaceful method of dealing with it. Please take note that this lecture represents one chapter in the book of his understanding, which he is also refining expanding, improving. It is, as all bits of wisdom are, a point of departure 
from which to begin our own journey into understanding so that we all might be able to pass on to others greater knowledge and hope and to God the gift of lives lived in peace, freedom, and praise. I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be you therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Open parenthesis, Matthew chapter 10, verse 16. Close parenthesis. Introduction. When I beat the IRS, I use Supreme Court, open bracket, SC, close bracket, decisions. If I had tried to use these in court, I would have been convicted. I was involved with a Patriot group, and I studied Supreme Court cases. I concluded that the SC, or Supreme Court, had declared that I was not a person required to file an income tax. That, that tax was an excise tax on privileges granted by government. So I quit filing and paying income taxes, and it was not long before they came down on me with a heavy hand. They issued a notice of deficiency, which had such a fantastic sum on it that the biggest temptation was to go in there with a letter and say, where in the world did you ever get that figure? They claimed I owed them some $60,000. But even if I had been paying taxes, I never in the world would have had that much money. So how could I have owed them that much? Section 1. Never argue the amount of deficiency. Fortunately, I had been given just a little bit of information. Never Argue facts in a tax case. Maxim. Arguments are for fools. If you're not required to file, what do you care whether they say you owe $60 or $60,000? If you are not required to file, the amount doesn't matter. Don't argue the amount. That is an issue of fact. In most instances, when you get a notice of deficiency, it is usually for some fantastic amount. The minute you say, I don't owe that much, you have voluntarily agreed that you owe them something, and you have just given them jurisdiction. Just don't be shocked at the amount on a notice of deficiency, even if it's $10 million. If the law says that you are not required to file or pay taxes, that amount doesn't matter. By arguing the amount, they would just say that you must go to tax court and decide what the amount is to be. By the time you get to tax court, the law issues are all decided. You are only there to decide how much you owe. They will not listen to arguments of law. So I went to see the agent, and I told him that I wasn't required to file. He said, you are required to file, Mr. Freeman. But I had all these Supreme Court cases, and I started reading them to him. He said, I don't know anything about law, Mr. Freeman, but the code says that you are required to file, and you're going to pay that amount, or you're going to go to tax court. I thought someone there ought to know something about law, so I asked to talk to his superior. I went to him and got out my Supreme Court cases, and he wouldn't listen to them. I don't know anything about law, Mr. Freeman. Finally, I got to the problems resolution officer, and he said the same thing. He said that the only person above him was the district director, so I went to see him. By the time I got to his office, they had phoned ahead and his secretary said he was out. But I heard someone in his office, and I knew he was there. So I went down the elevator, around the corner to the federal building, and into Senator Simpson's office. There was a girl sitting there at the desk, and she asked me if she could help me. I told her my problem. I asked her to call the IRS and tell them that it was Senator Simpson's office calling and to ask if the district director is in. I said, if you get him on the phone, Tell him that you are from the senator's office and you have a person whom you are sending over to speak to him. If he is, he can just wait five minutes. It worked. He was there. So I ran back up to his office. The secretary met me when I came in and said, Mr. Freeman, you're so lucky. The director just arrived. The director was very nice and offered me coffee and cookies. And we sat and talked. So he asked me, what did I want to talk to him about? If you've never had someone say to you, I'm from the government, and I'm here to help you. Watch out. But we can turn that around and approach them in the same way. So I said, I thought you ought to know that there are some agents working for you who are writing letters over your name that you wouldn't agree with them. Do you read all the mail that goes out of this office over your signature? The director said, oh, I couldn't read everything. It goes out here by the bag full. That was what I thought. 
I said, there are some of your agents writing letters which contradict the decisions of the Supreme Court of the United States, and they're not doing it over their name. They're doing it over your name. He was very interested to hear about it and asked if I had any examples. I just happened to have some with me, so I got them out and presented them to him. Open bracket, Supreme Court cases supporting Freeman's position, close bracket. The director thought it was very interesting and asked if I could leave this information with him, which I did. He said he would look it over and contact me within three days. Three days later, he called me up and said, I'm sure, Mr. Freeman, that you will be glad to know that your notice of deficiency has been withdrawn. We determined that you're not a person required to file. Your file is closed and you will hear no more from us. I haven't heard another word from them since. That was in 1980. I haven't filed since 1969. Section 2. The Supreme Court on Trial I thought, sure, I had the answer. But when a friend got charged with willful failure to file an income tax, he asked me to help him. I told him that they would have to prove that he willfully failed to file, and I suggested that he put me on the witness stand. He should ask me if I spoke at a certain time and place in Scott Buffs and I didn't see him in the audience. He should then ask me what I spoke about that day. When I got on the stand, I brought out all the Supreme Court cases I had used with the district director. I thought I'd be lucky to get a sentence or two out before the judge cut me off, but I was reading whole paragraphs, and the judge didn't stop me. I read one, and another, and so on. And finally, when I had read just about as much as I thought I should, the judge caught a recess of the court. I told Bob I thought we had made it. There was just no way that they could rule against him after all that. Testimony. So we relaxed. The prosecution presented its case, and he, Bob, decided to rest his case on my testimony, which showed that he was not required to file and that the Supreme Court had upheld this position. The prosecutor then presented his closing statements, and we were just sure that we had won. But at the very end, the judge spoke to the jury and told them, you will decide the facts of this case, and I will give you the law. The law required this man to file an income tax form, and you decide whether or not he filed it. What a shock. The jury convicted him. Later, some of the members of the jury said, what could we do? The man had admitted that he had not filed the form, so we had to convict him. As soon as the trial was over, I went around to the judge's office, and he was just coming in through his back door. I said, Judge, by what authority do you overturn the standing decisions of the United States Supreme Court? You sat on the bench while I read that case law. Now how do you, a district court judge, have the authority to overturn decisions of the Supreme Court? He says, oh, those were old decisions. I said, those are standing decisions. They have never been overturned. I don't care how old they are. You have no right to overturn a standing decision of the United States Supreme Court in a district court. Section 3. Public Law versus Public Policy He said, Name any decision of the Supreme Court after 1938, and I'll honor it. But all the decisions you read were prior to 1938. He went on, Prior to 1938, the Supreme Court was dealing with public law. Since 1938, the Supreme Court has dealt with public policy. The charge that Mr. S. was being tried for is a public policy statute, not public public law, and those Supreme Court cases did not apply to public policy. I asked him what happened in 1938. He said that he had already told me too much. He wasn't going to tell me anymore. Section 4, 1938, and the Erie Railroad. Well, I began to investigate. I found that 1938 was the year of the Erie Railroad versus Thompson's case of the Supreme Court. It was also the year the courts claimed they blended law with equity. I read the Erie Railroad case. A man had sued the Erie Railroad for damages when he was struck by a board sticking out of a box cart as he walked along beside the tracks. The district court had decided on commercial law, open parenthesis, negotiable instruments law, close parenthesis, that this man was not under any contract with the Erie Railroad and therefore he lacked standing to sue the company. Under common law, open parenthesis, natural law, close parenthesis, he was damaged, and he would have the right to sue. 
This overturned a standing decision of over 100 years. Swift versus Tyson in 1840 was a similar case, and the decision of the Supreme Court then was that in a case of this type, the court would judge by the common law or natural law of the state where the incident occurred, in this case, Pennsylvania. In the Erie Railroad case, the Supreme Court now ruled that all federal cases will be judged under the negotiable instruments of law. There will be no more decisions based on the common law at the federal level. So here we find the blending of law with equity. This was a puzzle to me. As I put these new pieces together, I reasoned that all our courts since 1938 were merchant law courts and not common law courts. There were still pieces missing from the puzzle. Section 5. A Friend in Court Fortunately, I made a friend of a judge. Now you won't make friends with a judge if you go into the court like a wolf in black. Sheep Country You must approach him as though you are a sheep and he is the wolf. You go into the court as a wolf if you make demands and tell the judge what the law is. Now he had better uphold the law or else. Remember the verse, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be you therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. We have to go into court and be wise and harmless and not make demands. We must be humble and play a little dumb and ask a lot of questions. Well, I asked a lot of questions and boxed the judge into a corner where they had to give me a victory or admit what they didn't want to admit. I won the next case. And on my way out, I had to stop by the clerk's office to get some papers. One of the judges stopped and said, You are an interesting man, Mr. Freeman. If you're ever in town, stop by. And if I'm not sitting on a case, we will visit. Section 6. America is bankrupt. Later, when I went to visit the judge, I told him of my problem with the Supreme Court cases dealing with public policy rather than public law. He said, In 1938, all the higher judges top attorneys and the U.S. attorneys were called into a secret meeting and this is what we were told. America is a bankrupt nation. It is owned completely by its creditors. The creditors own Congress. They own the executive. They own the judiciary and they own all the state governments. Take silent judicial notice of this fact but never reveal it openly. Your court is operating under admiralty jurisdiction. Call it anything you want but do not call it admiralty. Section 7. Admiralty Courts The reason they cannot call it admiralty jurisdiction is that your defense would be quite different in admiralty jurisdiction from your defense under the common law. In admiralty, no court has jurisdiction unless there is a valid international contract in dispute. When you know it is admiralty jurisdiction and they have admitted on the record that you are in admiralty court, you can demand that the international maritime contract to which you are supposedly party and which you supposedly have breached be placed into evidence. No court has admiralty forward slash maritime jurisdiction unless there is a valid international maritime contract that has been breached. So you say, just innocently, like a lamb, well, I never knew that I got involved with the international maritime contract, so I deny that such contract exists. If this court is talking jurisdiction and admiralty, then place the contract into evidence so that I might challenge the validity of the contract. What they would have to do is place the national debt into evidence. They would have to admit that the international bankers own the whole nation and that we are the bankers slaves. Section 8. Not Expedient but the banker said it is not expedient at this time to admit that they own everything and could foreclose on every nation of the world. Open bracket. This is the key behind the buildup of the United Nations as a military force. This is the key to disarming America. This is the key to ending the Cold War. Like now we have no more enemies. So we can melt all our guns. Wrong. The bankers plan to foreclose. They just don't want their heads blown off while doing it. So they dictate to Congress to get rid of the guns, etc. Close bracket. The reason they don't want to tell everyone that they own everything is that there are still too many privately owned guns in America today. There are uncooperative armies and other military forces. 
So until they can gradually consolidate all armies into a world army and all the courts into a world court, it is not expedient to admit the jurisdiction of the courts and they are operating under. When we understand this, we realize that there are certain secrets they do not want to admit and we can use this to our benefit. Section 9. Jurisdiction. The Constitution of the United States mentions three areas of jurisdiction in which the courts may operate. Section 10. Common Law. Common Law, open parenthesis, natural or constitutional law, close parenthesis, is based on our Creator's laws as originally presented by Moses. Anytime someone is charged under the common law, there must be a damaged party. You are free under the common law to do anything you pleases. As long as you do not infringe on life, liberty, or property of someone else, you have a right to make a fool of yourself provided you do not infringe on the life, liberty, or property of someone else. The common law does not allow for any government action which prevents a man from making a fool of himself. For instance, when you cross state line, you will probably see a sign which says, buckle your seat belts, it's the law. This cannot be common law because who would you injure if you did not buckle up? Nobody. This would be compelled performance, but common law cannot compel performance. Any violation of common law is a criminal act. This is punishable.